Hi. So someone suggested it might be good to explain to the YouTube um, the FAA's policy with regards to uh, transgender pilots, uh, which has changed over the years and is a little bit complicated. Um, and it's, I should emphasize, not the only reason that I have not been flying an airplane. Um, there's a lot of factors that have gone into that. Um, and honestly, the biggest one has just been money. You know, it's an expensive thing to do. And that's what I always try to remember is that it is a huge privilege that most people just never get to do. And although the policy is nonsense, um, you know, I try not to get too upset that I can't do it um, because, you know, most people just never get the opportunity to do it at all. Um, now, going past that, um, I'll explain again, what do you need to be legal to fly an airplane? Uh, well, you need three things. First, you need a pilot's license. Uh, here is mine, in case you want to see what one looks like uh, with my name and license number covered in tape. There's the back, same deal. Got some nice little Wright Brothers on there, and you can see private pilot, pi private pilot airplane, single engine land, uh, which is what I'm allowed to fly in principle if I had the other two things. And so the other two things are, um, if you want to fly passengers specifically, uh, not paying passengers, just anybody other than yourself in the airplane, uh, you need a second thing, which is what's called currency, um, not as in money, although flying definitely costs money, but as in you need to have flown under the same conditions that you're going to execute your flight under uh, in the recent past. Uh, and so really all that boils down to for uh, a simple private pilot's license like I have is uh, you need to do three landings in the preceding 90 days. Um, there are more complicated requirements as you go to more complicated, more advanced licenses and ratings and um, particularly type ratings um, where you're flying like an airliner or something, you really need to have flown, you know, three landings in that specific um, model of aircraft. Um, but but anyways, for you know, just just remember three landings in the last 90 days. That's all you all you really need. Um, so if you haven't been up in the last 90 days, you either you know you need to just basically go up by yourself and land three times, and you're good to go. If you own your own airplane, uh, or if you rent, which is what I've always done, uh, typically the uh, flying club that you rent from will require uh, that you be current to fly at all. Uh, and so if you ever lose your currency, it's super easy to fix. All you do is just go up with an instructor, knock out three landings, probably a little more. Um, you know, also while you're at it, you know, might, if you've, it's been three months since you flown, might as well, you know, just to be safe, uh, spend some time with, an, you know, just go up with an instructor for an hour or two anyways, and it's, it's never a bad idea uh, to go up and do that. Um, and then I, actually I should say there's four requirements because there's a, another thing that gets tacked on there, which is what's called a biennial flight review, uh, which is basically every, uh, every two years you have to have an instructor sign your logbook. Uh, oh, I should have, I should have kept my logbook handy so I could show you what one of those looks like as well. Um, but you know, you just basically every two years you are required to fly with an instructor uh, and they just, you know, it's not like getting the license where you have to go and go through a test just like you do with a driver's license. Uh, it's more just you go up with a flight instructor and assuming that they don't find any egregious problems with your flying, they sign that your logbook in your logbook that the biennial flight review has been completed. So that's biennial every two years. Um, so that, that kind of goes hand in hand with currency where it's like, you know, you know, first requirement is a license, and then requirements two and three kind of go together where they're essentially like you need to have flown sufficiently recently and you need someone to check your flying skills every once in a while. Um, that is a, a flight instructor. Um, and then there's the third and final thing, which I do not have, so I could not show you, even if I had remembered, although here's a license. Let me all right, let me just let me grab my logbook because it's they're 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 pretty neat actually. And I'll I'll just show you what one looks like real quick. Oh, oh, my wardrobe getting in the way. Here's my flight bag. Everyone should have one. It's just an excuse for me to go through my old flying stuff. Oh, here we go. Yeah, so 
pilot logbook. And then let me see if I can open up a page of this without any identifying information. Uh, it has my, does it have my instructor's original signature? No, this, okay. Th these are some pages that don't have, this is, this is actually uh, my first logbook from when I first started flying, um, which I uh, actually didn't end up continuing to use for stupid reasons. But anyways, they all got transcribed into this one. So let me see if I can find something that just doesn't have any identifying information from my instructor. Oh yeah, here we go. So it looks like this. There's, you know, all the hours I flew and then uh, signatures from the instructor from when I was flying with an instructor, uh, still getting my license uh, or advancing my license at various points. And so you need that signed every two years. Okay. As well as you also need from your own records uh, that you have landed three times in the last 90 days. All right. So moving past that, what's the third thing, which I, if I had one, you see, there's this, oh, let me get the logbook back out. I have this handy dandy envelope taped to my logbook, which is full of nothing. It's empty because guess what? That is where I would have a medical certificate. And what's a medical certificate? A medical certificate is something that shows that a doctor has certified that you do not have, essentially it's saying a doctor has gone through and certified your health and verified that you do not have any health problems that might make you unsafe to fly. Now, the FAA is notoriously persnickety about the medical certificate and transgender pilots are not the only people that have had issues with their medical certificates for reasons that are not entirely rational. The FAA does understandably err on the side of caution. Um, you know, one issue that a lot of uh, older pilots end up having is if you have uh, any even slightest indication of a, a heart problem, uh, they will revoke your medical certificate. And uh, if you get like one of the higher levels of medical certificate, like for airline transport pilot, uh, which is the basically the, the, the highest level of license you can get, they will uh, actually do an EKG on you uh, and be very, very thorough. So that's a notorious thing, although that you can kind of understand, right? You don't want pilots suddenly, you know, having some heart problem in flight. But again, it, the slightest indication of a problem, they will revoke a medical certificate. But that one's at least kind of understandable. So another thing is the FAA is very persnickety and always has been about any medications whatsoever that you take. And there is a list, a you know, of approved medications with their approved uses. And... Hormone replacement therapy is technically a medication, and so it does technically count as something you are taking. On top of that, uh, gender dysphoria, uh, formerly I think it was gender identity disorder, uh, is considered a psychiatric condition and as such requires certification. And both of those things is where we run into our issue. So for uh, the hormone therapy side, you, but that's that that's the thing that's ridiculous is you would think that it would be uh, more on the hormones therapy side of things where it's like, okay, these are something that affect your physiology and they're generally considered safe. So let's just do a quick check to make sure they're not adversely affecting um, how your body operates, right? It's like spironolactone for trans women, very commonly prescribed, is also something that can lower your blood pressure. Let's make sure that that's not going to, you know, uh, inadvertently drop your blood pressure during a critical phase of flight and cause you to lose some concentration or something like that, uh, that would make sense. That's not what they do at all. What they do instead is that they insist that being trans is some like, you know, deep psychiatric disorder that absolutely in every case requires uh, extreme levels of psychological and psychiatric testing. And it has gotten, I should emphasize, it has slowly gotten better over the years, right? Uh, way back when, it was basically impossible. If you wanted to transition and you were a pilot, kiss your license goodbye. Uh, then it changed, and it became possible to keep your license and keep, keep your medical certificate, really, if you got 
thousands and thousands of dollars in what they call neurocognitive testing. Uh, and so that's something we're very particular where it's like it's uh, it's evaluating not just your psychological stability, but also your sort of it's not really testing your reflexes, but think about it like testing your almost like testing your reflexes. It's it's doing a bunch of cognitive testing that's designed to test your neurophysiology. And it's complicated exactly what that means and what it boils down to, but all you really need to know is it's really friggin' expensive. And people used to have to do it, and it would be really completely prohibitively expensive unless you were an airline pilot and your company was willing to pay for it because they, you know, wanted to retain you as a pilot. Um, so then there was a lawsuit, and in the early 2000s, the policy finally changed. And it became such that uh, you no longer needed that neurocognitive testing. And this is when I tried to renew my medical certificate as I was going through transition. And I thought, okay, great, you know, no more neurocognitive testing. I just need a regular, you know, I'll tell the doctor that I'm taking the hormones as my list of medications and they will certify that everything's fine. It's great. Uh, no, that's not what happened. The doctor actually, you know, and I don't think he meant to do, you know, any harm. I think he, as a perfectly rational person, thought, oh, yeah, these aren't going to cause any, you know, cognitive issues. You know, why would there be anything? I'll just sign off like I always would. Um, and he did. And he said, you should be fine. And I was like, great. And I kept flying for maybe like two, three months. Um, although not flying very much because, again, I was trying to do this on a graduate student's gallery. So I did try to make sure to fly enough that I felt that I was safe. Uh, and if I ever went longer than I felt was appropriate um, without flying, I, you know, even if I was still legal to fly, uh, if I just felt that I hadn't gotten enough hours in the last, like, you know, six months or something, uh, I would just, you know, go up with an instructor real quick and say, hey, let's just go over these things. And every time it was great and they said I was, you know, still a good pilot and everything was fine. Um, but at any rate, you know, I ended up uh, spending about three months, you know, after I got my medical certificate renewed flying, thinking everything was fine. And then I get a letter in the mail from the FAA saying, oh, by the way. Uh, we actually need you to get certified by an aerospace psychiatrist, uh, which I was unable to find such a thing. I tried looking into just getting a regular psychiatrist to certify me, uh, but there wasn't really anybody that was willing to do it, and certainly not anybody that was willing to do it on my insurance, so I would have had to pay out of pocket for it, which again, would not have been anywhere near as bad as it was before. Like In the previous policy, it would have been like, you know, say $20,000, whereas just paying for a couple hours of a psychiatrist out of pocket, that might be like, you know, that could be a lot of money. That could be like five or six hundred dollars, but still, that's better than twenty grand. Um, but still, you know, it was it was something. And more importantly, I couldn't find anybody that was a quote unquote aerospace psychiatrist, uh, whatever that means. Or and and oh, and an aerospace psychologist. I needed both a psychologist and a psychiatrist to certify uh, that I was fine. Um, you know, so I ended up just surrendering my medical certificate because I didn't have the you know the time or the money or the, quite frankly, just energy, because uh, I was in the middle of trying to get a PhD in physics, uh, to get any of that done. And now, I should emphasize, I am not a good example of a sob story about why the FAA's policy of nonsense. That's point number one. Point number two is they have actually subsequently improved it a bit more, uh, where if you are five or more years into your transition, you no longer need to do any of this. Uh, I was not. I was maybe a year and a half into my transition when I tried to renew my medical certificate. And so uh, things did not work out for me. Uh, if I were to do it today, it has been, it has actually been five years. Um, it's more complicated uh, now because I have subsequently, uh, you know, had like, you know, depression in part because I couldn't do the thing I loved. Uh, so that would now count as a like ancillary uh, psychological problem. Uh, although I, you know, generally think that it doesn't make me unsafe to fly, it just makes me an unhappy person, uh, in part because I can't fly, although again, you know, flight did not exist for most of human history, and most people never get to fly, so it's not like, oh, if only I could fly, I would be happy, no, but again, I'm just not a good example of like a sob story, right, but you should understand that there are people that do everything right, and they don't get to fly, I'm an example of somebody that, you know, um, 
definitely didn't do everything perfectly right. Um, so anyways, um, but yeah, so I actually stopped taking hormones at one point and then they wouldn't let me go back on them, um, because of reasons, uh, why did I go off them? Well, basically I just like, you know, got depressed and, you know, didn't have insurance for a while, um, and was on a leave of absence from graduate school. Uh, anyways, yeah, so I won't get into that too much. I think I already did in another video. So I'm a bad example, um, but uh, I do think I'm a good pilot. Uh, no flight instructor has ever said otherwise. I've never been involved in any incidents, and every unexpected in-flight problem I've run into either as a result of just you know crazy air traffic patterns or maintenance issues with the aircraft, um, you know, I've dealt with, I think, quite well. Um, by maintenance issues, I mean things that were unexpected, or I should say reliability issues with the aircraft, right? I, you know, I, you're, not, you're not actually required to check the maintenance logs as just a pilot, only the owner, but, you know, you are required to check, basically check if what's called squawks, make sure that nobody has said don't fly this airplane and do various things, and you do do various checks, and I've always done those correctly and successfully, um, but I have run into issues in the air, um, minor issues. I just had uh, an electrical failure in the aircraft, uh, and I was able to to get it on the ground uh, at a towered airport. Anyways, uh, the only reason it was a problem is because I was going to a towered airport, so I needed the radio to work. Um, you know, an electrical failure is usually not uh, an emergency under visual conditions. It is under inst potentially under instrument conditions because then you're you're you really need you really need those systems to work. But at any rate, I you know I dealt with that just fine. I've dealt with, you know, highly congested airspace is just fine. I've dealt with uh, unexpected people that were not where they were supposed to be in airspaces and, uh, you know, didn't even come close to mid-air collisions. So I like to think I'm actually a pretty decent pilot. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's a stupid policy and it's, 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 I don't know. I, I People lose the ability to fly for all sorts of reasons, and it's not always fair. In fact, it's very frequently unfair. And in fact, it's totally unfair that a lot of people that would love to fly an airplane uh, never get to. The stupid part, or the part that bothers me, is that it's stupid. It's a policy that has no basis in reality. If it was a policy that was unfair, but that at least had some semblance of a basis in reality, I would understand. But it doesn't. It's based on nothing. Show me the incidents of a transgender pilot having some neurocognitive issue in the air and it causing an incident. Guess how many there are? This many. That's all.